Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome, everyone. Um, tonight's training is going to focus on how to organize your own advocacy days. So thank you for joining us. And if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, so my name is Nada Sumik, and I am the National Field Manager for We Are All America. Um, I'm also a former refugee from Bosnia or originally. Um, and just to give you a little bit of background about me, and then I will pass it over to Anahita. I um, started out as a uh, grassroots organizer in the state of Arizona, where I reside. And we started, um, We I launched a coalition called the We Are All America Arizona Coalition about four years ago. And so uh, before that, a lot of our um, refugee partners and organizations really were working in silo and not kind of working collectively and nor putting any type of um, advocacy events. It was really, really new um, idea at the time. And so we started organizing and um, the coalition started putting together um, our advocacy days. And really what came out of that is um, an amazing opportunity for collaboration, for um, the refugee community to be um, seen in the spotlight and not just as this invisible um, uh, population or community. And so it's the, the advocacy events have really grown here in Arizona and people really look forward to them and, and bring people together. Um, so that's a little bit about our event and I'm gonna pass it over to Anahita to introduce herself and provide some background on her. Thank you so much, Neda. Um, hi everyone, my name is Anahita Panahi. Um, I am the California Refugee Campaign Manager. Um, I'm housed out of Churla and also working on the We Are All America campaign. Really excited to be here. Um, I am also the product of refugee parents from Iran. I am an immigrant myself. And similar to NADA and, and creating a coalition at the state level, um, we also did the state, same thing here in California, a more progressive blue state. Um, and um, really trying to ensure that we can include refugees and asylum seekers in our advocacy efforts. Um, and what came out of creating a coalition through partnerships, research, advocacy, um, and coming together with um, unusual allies um, was the creation of um, case management for asylees in the state of California. Um, and this was all possible through hosting advocacy days at the state capitol. Um, so we're really looking forward to talk a little bit uh, today about how we can organize our own advocacy days um, whether it be at the local or state level, and how you can really maximize um, your efforts with partners and best practices. We know we have a short time with you today, only one hour, uh, but we hope to really get the most important uh, points across to you today uh, to be able to successfully host your own advocacy days and advocate for policy change. Uh, thank you, Neda. I'll pass it back to you. All right, and if we can go to the next slide, please. So. Um... Today's goal of uh, the today's workshop is to really learn how to organize your own local and state advocacy days. Uh, as we mentioned, the, these events have a significant purpose um, and really they are an opportunity for you to educate your lawmakers uh, on refugee and immigrant issues and to advocate for pro-refugee and pro-immigrant policies and those that impact our communities. So today we're gonna cover, um, we're gonna tell you a little bit about We Are All America and Churla. We're gonna um, share with you how you can get started on organizing an advocacy event, um, the importance of partnerships, some of the logistics involved in, in, in planning something like this, power mapping, um, organizing actual legislative visits, best practices, preparing your speakers and testimonies. We'll have a Q&A session and then we'll um, wrap up. So I know that's a lot of content, so let's go ahead and dive right into it. So next slide. Um, so We Are All America works to uphold our nation's uh, and strengthen our nation's commitment to um, those who are seeking freedom, safety, and refuge in the U.S. We really work um, to organize refugee communities in many, many states. Um, we started out with five states, and now we're in 21 different states with our partners. And some of our national partners include organizations like Church World Service, 
uh, Refugee Congress, National Partnership for New Americans, Refugee Council for USA, Alianza America, and so on and so forth. Uh, most of our organizers are um, organizers or, who are composed themselves, who are former refugees, have come here through the U.S. Refugee Resettlement Program or asylees. Some are uh, from a Middle Eastern background, African or Muslim American background. Um, so that's a little bit about our work, and I'll pass it on to Anahita to talk about Churla. Uh, thank you so much, Nada. Um, so Churla, the Coalition for Humane Immigrant Rights, uh, was founded in 1986 um, to advance the human and civil rights of immigrants and refugees. Um, Churla has become a place um, for the everyday person to really get involved in advocacy efforts. Um, Churla has really been a beacon of grassroots organizing um, at the local, state, and national level and is one of the steering committee members of We Are All America and has really put an effort the past couple of years to be inclusive of fighting and advancing the rights of refugees within the immigrants' right movement. So really excited to be here and uh, joining our forces to learn more about how we can um, host advocacy days. Thank you, Nada. All right, so next slide. And just to get an idea, if you all can type in the chat box, um, if you have organized an advocacy event or not, or um, if you are on the phone, feel free to unmute yourself. So if you have or have not organized an advocacy event and uh, type in the chat box what you would like to mostly learn about organizing an advocacy event. So let me give it about one or two minutes just to open it up to for you to share if you have or have not organized an event and what you would like to learn if you have not. And feel free to type it in the chat box or unmute yourself. And don't be shy. Anyone like to share? Maybe one or two people? I can share. Um, hey y'all, this is uh, Kosar from um, the Tennessee Immigrant and Refugee Rights Coalition. So. Um, I haven't yet um, uh, helped with an advocacy event or Refugee Day in the Hill, but I'm hoping to uh, do that start of 2022, uh, looking it to be like sometime in March. Uh, and I'm, you know, look, you know, trying to find kind of best practices on how to, you know, first kind of talk to community members about, you know, what advocacy days are and really trying to kind of develop them so that they can be the, you know, can speak and, you know, talk uh, uh, and kind of lead, lead this, uh, lead the event. So just looking just for strategy uh, um, from other folks. Wonderful. Thank you, Kosar, for sharing. Anyone else want to share? I can go ahead and share. My name is uh, Pierre. I'm with uh, Florida Immigrant Coalition. And uh, I can't say that I haven't organized events. I have organized so many events, but not, not uh, advocacy ones. So I would like to learn today about, you know, what advocacy is and how can we organize the, you know, events. And for, for, for immigrants, I have organized events for other, you know, types of people and in different places, but, this one focusing on immigrants and refugees. So I want to learn more about that. Thank you for sharing. Neda, you muted yourself. Sorry about that. Probably couldn't hear me. Um, so on how to get started, the first thing that you wanna do is really um, identify what your purpose and your goal for your advocacy is. And you want to make sure that you're really clear on your goals and objectives for the event. And when I say the purpose, are you going to be introducing legislation? Um, are you going to be supporting legislation that may align with your community? Or are you going to be providing just um, education to legislators and building relationships? So you really want to be clear and you can do more than one of those. You can provide education to legislators, and you can push for legislation at the same time, right? So, but you just want to be very clear on your goals and your objectives. 
Um, also, um, the, the another thing that you want to initially do when you start planning is identifying a date uh, right away. Um, I will say planning for something like this, depending on how big of an event you want. It doesn't need to be uh, a really big event if this is something you're just starting and you have small capacity. Um, but if it's if you're planning to do something at a little bit of a bigger capacity, um, I would suggest that you start planning a few months in advance, at least about two to three months in advance. And um, as I was mentioning, you really want to be strategic in uh, picking and selecting your date for your advocacy days, um, because it will uh, depend really on when your session starts for your state. Each state um, has different se legislative sessions, when they start and when they end, and they're not all year long. So, for example, here in Arizona, our session starts January 10th and ends around May timeframe, mid-May, depending on when the legislators finish the state budget. So um, during those days, during those months is when you would want to host advocacy days. Um, outside of that, legislators are actually not at the state capitol. They're not in meetings, in session. So you wouldn't want to schedule something outside of the session time. Also, there are um, times during the session that um, are uh, relevant. So for example, the first 10 days of the session here in Arizona, um, 10 to 14 days is when you are able to introduce legislation. And there is a deadline to introduce legislation. Um, and so you cannot submit, for example, if you're pushing for a bill to be introduced, you cannot introduce it at the end of the session. There is a, a specific time when you can do that and when that bill is going to be heard in the House and the Senate. And so you just want to be really strategic in selecting your days for advocacy. Um, also, one of the things at the beginning when you start planning, what you want to do is you want to organize your partners. This should not be something that you are doing on your own. This should be something that involves other um, uh, community members, volunteers, uh, and other partners, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and so you want to just confirm all those logistics. Um, so let's go to the next slide. And Anahita, feel free to add anything I may have left out. And these visuals here are just uh, events that we've had in the past. So one is actually from Florida Immigrant Coalition. They worked on uh, anti-immigrant legislation. Another is from this year from Oregon, from Portland, Oregon, where they were able to pass an office for new Americans and they supported several other bills around access to childcare, um, uh, funding for addiction recovery, getting law enforcement out of school. So there was a few different initiatives that they helped support in the state of Oregon, which is what they introduced during their advocacy days. And the pictures below are um, our advocacy days here in Arizona. Um, the picture on the left has different faith leaders that were part of our press conference. And so you can really get um, creative and in, in, involved in, in different ways for these events. Um, let's go to the next slide. So, um, as I mentioned with partners, um, it's really important that you are pushing policy change and that you are doing this through community su support and through partnerships. Um, that is really key. And what you want to do is you want to do a lot of outreach to different community members especially those with lived experience. Um, so for example, if you work within the refugee or immigrant community, you want refugee and immigrants to be part of that planning process. You want them to have a say in, in that. Um, if you work with faith leaders, you wanna engage them. If you work, if you have, for example, a, a business entity, maybe like a refugee owned business that likes to be part of the planning process, engage them. Um, so there could be a lot of, you should have a diverse uh, uh, number of stakeholders that are going to help organize this with you, and it shouldn't just be you leading it. Um, so the ways that you can do this is what we usually do is we put together a planning committee sometime around this month or November, because our session starts in January. 
So you want to organize like a planning committee and have ongoing meetings or however you want to organize it. Ours are virtual just because it's easier and more convenient for everyone. Um, if you work through a coalition, um, you want to mobilize your coalition members um, or other organizations. Like, let's say if you don't have the capacity to host your own um, advocacy event, but there's another organization that's hosting it, um, you can get involved in supporting that organization. So um, another thing that's really important is you want to make sure if you do have your own coalition or that you're working with or your own pl planning committee, you want to make sure that everyone has uh, a designated role. If they decide um, and volunteer to be uh, part of the planning committee or their volunteers, you want to make sure that you give people clear roles and designated tasks. Otherwise, all that is gonna fall on you. And you do not wanna take that on that much responsibility because we all have um, you know, uh, limitations on our capacity. So for example, on your planning committee, you can assign someone to do policy tracking on your state. And each um, state has their legislative websites that you can Google and where you can track bills. So the reason this is important is you wanna, if you work within the refugee community, you wanna track if there's any anti-refugee or anti-immigrant bills that come up that you're gonna need to prepare for. Um, also, another role could be speaking at committee hearings. Um, and if you are working on legislation, uh, this is really important. When you go to committee hearings, them hearing from impacted people that is really important. So you can have someone from your steering or your planning committee do that. Um, someone to work on just recruiting attendees and registering attendees. Someone to work on the marketing and the flyer. So um, the point is that you just want to make sure that you assign tasks to your volunteers and really utilize them um, to help you with with an event like this. So. Um, yeah, I think, was there anything else, Anahita, that I needed to cover or anything you need to add? I think you covered it perfectly. Okay, perfect. And then the next slide, um, just a couple of things to uh, keep in mind as far as logistics are concerned. You want to make sure that you identify the type of event that you are putting on. Given the COVID pandemic, things have really changed a lot. We used to do these in person, but since COVID, many people have switched to hosting these virtual, which is fine. If you want to host a virtual event, that's totally fine. Um, you just wanna make sure you get familiar with the virtual platform and scheduling meetings. Um, it could also be in person if you feel comfortable, depending on, you know, where you live and, and your, your group, your organization, or you can have something like a hybrid where um, some meetings are virtual, some are in person. You can have your legislative meetings be virtual and you have an in-person event outside of your state capital. That's something, for example, we're doing in Arizona. Also, other things you can do is outside of the legislative meetings, you can have um, a press conference, you can have, um, you can tour, schedule a tour for your state capital. Um, for many former refugees that arrived, um, for many former refugees that arrived, they've never been to the state capital. And so giving them that opportunity to see um, is really, really wonderful. Also, you could do tabling events. You can have uh, table organizations table um, table at, at the state capitol where they provide information and invite legislators. You can do a luncheon for legislators. So there's a lot of ways that you can host this event. It's not just one way. It, there's an opportunity for you to um, host it in many different ways. Um, also, it's important to reserve the date and location at your state capital if you are going to do it in person as soon as possible. Usually, these types of venues get booked out very quickly. So, for example, we're hosting our event end of February, and it's already getting booked out. So, we need to, we're reserving right now that space. Um, as far as how to actually schedule legislative meetings, 
Um, number one, you want to just create a email template, a simple email draft or template that invites legislators to your meeting. Um, that way you can, and we're happy to share some of ours if, if you uh, if you all need it, but it's just a simple invitation email and you can reuse that instead of writing each email. Um, and it is important to know that you are working directly with the assistance of legislators, their staff members, and they mostly communicate via email. They get so many phone calls. And so it's important that you email them and that you are really clear what you're asking, the date, the time for what you're um, asking to meet with them. And if they don't email you back, don't be surprised or um, don't get offended. Just email them again because they get like 500 emails a day. So don't get offended. Don't get upset. It just means that they did not have time to review your email. Some legislators, though, if they don't support your cause, they may not, their staff may not intentionally want to meet with you and you may not get a response. So don't be surprised by that, too. Um, also, have someone like a volunteer or your group lead schedule the meetings. You really don't want to be doing that on your own. Um, for example, here in Arizona, we scheduled last year, uh, we had over 45 legislative meetings. So you can imagine the coordination of that. You don't want to take all that upon yourself. You really want to have group leads that are going to help you coordinate all those meetings. Um, and just be sure to create uh, material. So for your legislative mis visits, you want to have material that's ready. Um, after your meeting to provide to them like a packet with the information, who is a refugee, who is an asylum seeker, who is an asylee, important statistics. Um, you also want to have, so that's one packet. The other packet is for your participants. You really want to prepare your participants for their meeting. So talking points, what they're going to say. Um, statistics on refugees. Many times we get community members who just care about the refugee community and want to be let their legislator know, but they don't know much information. So it's important to provide them like a refugee 101. Um, so yeah, I know that's a lot, but th this is why you have volunteers and this is why you want to start planning early so you can take your time putting these materials together. So that being said, I'm going to hand it over to Anahita, who's going to talk a little bit about power mapping. Thank you so much, Nada. Um, we're going to be talking about my favorite part. Um, so now that we've talked um, a little bit about how to get started with our advocacy days, partnerships and logistics, we can now start focusing on identifying our legislative agenda. And in order to do that, we need to follow a process called power mapping. So I just want to gauge the room and see how many folks are familiar with power mapping. And you can put it in the chat box. You can shout it out, or you can put an emoji, thumbs up emoji. Hi. Oh, switch. Okay, I see some thumbs up. Okay, I see, I, I don't know, I see I'm familiar. Okay, all right, so we have a mixed group and that gives me a better sense of where we stand on power mapping. Power mapping is a very important tool to identify your legislative agenda and to be able to push your legislative agenda forward. Um, this is going to be able to provoke leg legislative change, maybe demand corporate social responsibility and or shift public opinion. So as we start our advocacy initiatives and as we build our own capacity as organizers or advocates, it's critical to analyze the power structures involved. Okay, not to hear nothing now. If, can we please mute ourselves? I hear some background noise. Okay, thank you. So it's an order, it, it's very important to analyze the power structures involved in policies and processes that you are either advocating for or against. And so um, one of the things that we really have to familiarize ourselves with is um, the keyword targets, right? So when we think of targets, um, they can either be allies, opponents, decision makers, influencers. And all of these components are going to be really important to identify how you're going to be able to move your legislative agenda forward um, 
and or potentially backwards if you're not identifying the key folks who either need to be part of your campaign or not. And so if we can just go ahead and move on to the next slide. Okay, so to begin the process of power mapping, we need to identify all of the stakeholders and actors involved in this particular issue. Before we start talking about who these potential um, who these potential actors are, um, I want to discuss a little bit about um, power mapping, right? Power mapping allows advocacy groups to systemically um, lay out power dynamics across our campaigns, maybe coalition efforts, so we can focus on our main target, the one who's going to be able to make the change that you want to see, while also eliminating other potential connections and recognizing opposition, so you can minimize that if needed. Um, power mapping is used by organizations across the globe to forge alliances, uh, build support, do the most targeted actions, and be politically relevant and strategic. And it's most important to be able to build awareness and legitimacy of your group. Um, so we're going to discuss the different targets that we have. And so I'm sure we're all familiar with allies, right? These are our friends. Um, allies are people who are on your side, either because they will benefit directly or because they will share the same objective and want to help bring about these changes as part of a broader movement. So an example of a ally is if you are advocating for a pro-refugee legislation, then you would think of resettlement agencies, right, who work with refugees directly, or ethnic community-based organizations who work with these marginalized groups as an ally to be part of your coalition and your advocacy efforts. Another target that we have are benefici beneficiaries. These are people whose lives will actually be improved and impacted by the successful achievement of these advocacy goals. So an example of a beneficiary could be a refugee, for example, that would benefit from that piece of legislation getting passed through um, the, the, the assembly, the Senate, and then through the governor's office um, into your state. And again, these allies and beneficiaries can be used interchangeably. Sometimes they do fit both of these targets. So really important to note that. Uh, next slide, please. Great. And now we have, oh, let's go back one. Oh, I think we moved too forward. Now we need to go backwards. <laughs> All right. And one more. Okay, great, thank you. And so opponents are, as you guessed it, uh, folks who are opposed what you're trying to do and are likely to actively oppose you. And so some of these could potentially become allies in time, right? I know uh, in Arizona, they've been able to garner support from uh, d individuals that were maybe not so immigrant friendly. Uh, but these are opponents that you really want to make sure that you are targeting to, to ensure that you minimize any potential opposition uh, when you are fighting for legislative change, right? So an example of an opponent would potentially be a very anti-immigrant conservative a lawmaker or influencer, for example, um, and you want to ensure that you can minimize any opposition that they would cause uh, to your advocacy efforts. The other really important target to keep in mind are decision makers, right? So this could be one of the most important targets that you need to have in order to drive your legislative agenda forward. These are individuals with authority or power to make the change that you would like to see. So these are our well-beloved lawmakers, right? Local electeds, Congress members, state elected officials, um, those that are able to vote, right, on policy, on budgets, and those that are actually able to pass it through the finish line. So. For us, as an example here in California, when we wanted to identify champions, and that's another word that's used when we are identifying um, our targets in the legislature, um, these champions typically have a track record of supporting and or introducing pro-refugee and immigrant legislation. So when we wanted to identify one here in California, we did a lot of research, right, to see, okay, who had that history of supporting, um, you know, pro-refugee and immigrant legislation? Did, were they included in any of the sign-on letters that we had sent out in the previous letters? 
okay, well, you know, what is their immigrant experience? Do they have any uh, lived experiences themselves? And we typically find that those um, that do come from refugee and immigrant backgrounds are more keen to actually champion um, these sorts of legislation. So really important to keep in mind that there's a lot of behind the scenes, right? There's a lot of research that goes on behind the scenes when identifying your targets, particularly the decision makers who are actually going to be able to drive that policy change forward. And the one other um, uh, target that we're going to discuss are influencers, right? So um, this is pretty like popular uh, culture, right? Like we've heard of the term uh, influencers. These are individuals that have, um, you know, a high position. Um, they have a lot of knowledge and or status. They typically have a large following and they are able to um, influence those with power in the decision making process. So again, another example here in California, um, when we wanted to get Governor Newsom here in California to pass an $8 million budget allocation to provide case management to asylees, we reached out to um, Mayor Garcetti here in Los Angeles, and we asked, um, you know, hey, since you're such a supporter of refugee and immigrants, can you maybe have a conversation or send a letter of support to the governor's office to ensure that this is signed. And they did just that. They sent a letter of support, which definitely influenced that decision, even though Mayor Garcetti actually cannot vote right on this budget. But the influence is a very important process of when we are trying to, um, you know, fight for policy change, introduce anything new, or maybe fight against um, uh, an anti-immigrant piece of legislation. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. All right. So now we've kind of, you know, identified what targets are and why they're so important as part of the power mapping process. Um, the power mapping process is going to be very important um, when you are moving your legislative um, agenda forward. Um, you can have several targets, right? Um, it's very important to be focused. So typically the fewer that you have, the better because you are able to pursue your agenda. Sometimes we stretch ourselves thin when we try to get too many targets. So being really vigilant and intentional when we are trying to identify our targets. And we typically have two sets of targets. We have primary targets and secondary targets. So primary targets are individuals with the ultimate power, right? So these are your elected officials, senators, um, deans, uh, local elected officials, and those who have the power to make the change that you want to see. The secondary targets are the influencers, right? So the opinions and actions of these influencers are important in achieving uh, the advocacy objective um, as they actually affect the opinions and actions of the decision makers, right? So that example that I gave around Mayor Garcetti influencing Governor Newsom's decision definitely had a correlation. So secondary targets can be just as important as primary targets, okay? So let's go ahead and move on to the next. Um, awesome. This map has been really helpful for some of our students here in California when we do our leadership training. Um, it's really helpful for our own advocacy efforts as well um, because it really kind of puts down, um, you know, puts it down on a piece of paper um, on how to identify your targets, right? Who your target would be as part of the decision-making process, right? who you have maybe potentially being against you and, you know, hoping to minimize any of that, um, who could be supporters, right, allies. And then there may be some folks who may have no influence, right? You don't want to bother um, to actually waste time um, and effort and energy to, um, to have discussions with those that don't have influence in your legislative agenda. Um, so really important that you're being mindful about who you're actually targeting as part of uh, your advocacy days, right? Um, so asking yourself, like, who can you bring into this campaign? Who can you bring into this coalition or to your advocacy days? Who are the stakeholders? Who are the supporters? Do we have any potential opposers, right? We know that the power dynamics look very different in Arizona and Florida than to California, right? So here we're more progressive and blue and we're more, um, you know, going after champions. 
uh, a pro-refugee legislation and maybe in more red states, they're fighting back against anti-immigrant and refugee legislation, which I'm sure uh, many of you here um, can relate to that. Um, and so it, you know, each state is gonna look very different, um, but it's really important to map out the power dynamic. Um, and this table included is really helpful to map out your campaign, campaign allies beneficiaries, opponents, decision makers, and those who can actually influence the decision makers. Um, so these are all very key powerful uh, things to keep in mind um, when you are either creating your campaign or your advocacy efforts, your coalition, and or partnering with other organizations external from your own. Um, but has proven to be really helpful. And I would um, really um, encourage everyone to, uh, you know, go over the slides, again, look at this, you know, the power dynamics in your state to really target um, those who are going to be able to push your legislative uh, agenda forward. So I know that was a lot, um, but I'm going to go ahead and stop there and uh, pass it back to Nada. Thanks, Anahita. And I would just emphasize um, to what Anahita was saying with being really clear with your targets. And um, for example, here in Arizona, we started out when we started organizing our, our advocacy days, we uh, introduced a welcoming resolution um, into the state, Arizona state legislature that supports and welcomes uh, refugees. And so we really wanted to identify who our key targets were. So one of the individuals that we identified was a lawmaker who uh, from the Republican Party who could sponsor the bill and um, really push it forward, introduce it. And when I say sponsor, it really means to introduce the bill and carry the bill. And so he was our target and our ally at the same time. Um, later in the, in the, during our session, what we discovered was the bill was introduced and moved forward in the, in the different committees, but then we got stuck in one particular committee with a target, uh, lawmaker that was against us. And he happened to be the chair of this committee. It was in the judiciary committee. So then we had to really rally our allies to, um, you know, make calls to this um, lawmaker to um, get other um, legislators who could potentially talk to him and um, get him to support the legislation. And so there are different ways um, that you can, you know, go through this process, but this is where power mapping is really key that you really wanna be intentional about it um, as you move forward. So that being said, let's go to the next slide. Now that you learned a little bit about power mapping, um, now it's time to really prepare your speakers and your testimonies as you're getting ready for your legislative meetings. So um, one thing that you want to always do is you want to have uh, advocacy prep training for your participants, usually about a week or two weeks out before your actual event. And really this event, this training should be mandatory for all the participants where you will go over all of the information uh, with them about your event, the logistics, and also um, an opportunity for them to uh, meet with their group leads. So your group leads, in addition to the advocacy prep training, your group leads um, or your legislative leads should prep their groups. And the way that these groups are usually broken down is by district and based on, you know, um, what district you live in. So you may have an, a, a group of two people, you may have a group of five people, depending on the district um, and how many people sign up to attend your event. Um, but they should have, your group lead should provide them with clear talking points and they should review that uh, before their scheduled appointment, legislative appointment. So um, there's a couple of different roles in these groups that folks play. Number one is the facilitator who does the introduction and that's usually the group lead who does that. Number two is the ally, as you guys probably remember what Anahita was just talking about. So you have your allies, your faith leaders, your community members, a veteran, 
Um, so that's an, another uh, person. You have your storyteller. So this is your impacted person. So you, if you have a former refugee in your group, um, uh, an asylee, um, this is the time for them to share their story. And this is really important that this is prioritized and really trying to, if you have the capacity to have um, someone, an impacted person in each group. Um, that really, really makes a difference. Um, and finally, you should have someone who uh, makes the ask for the legislator. So what is your ask? Are you asking them to support your bill, your legislation? Are you asking them to be more engaged with your community? Um, are you asking them um, to drop a certain bill that is anti-refugee, anti-immigrant. So whatever the ask is, usually that's done at the end and you really wanna be clear with that and um, and then uh, allow for Q&A time. Also, um, make sure that you have like a note taker in your group um, and one person can have more than one role if you have a really small group, but you should have your group meet at least 15 minutes to beforehand to prepare for the meeting and then 15 minutes after to debrief. Um, and also it's really important that you follow up with your elected official, that you send them a follow-up email and that packet that I talked about at the beginning, that should be sent in that email. So um, I would also emphasize it's really important that one person is not hogging the whole time, speaking the whole time or speaking over someone and um, that everyone just has their talking points really laid out. Let's go to the next slide. So best practices for legislative visits. Um, make sure that you read the instructions and review all the materials sent. That's really important. Um, practice what you want to say beforehand. You can do this in your groups. Make sure you test your technology if you're having virtual meetings, that your camera works, that your of Wi-Fi, your mic work, that your video works. Um, sign on several minutes earlier that there are not any tech issues or your computer needing to restart, anything like that. When you're speaking, be concise, um, stay on the topic, uh, don't interrupt others and be respectful of everyone's time. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, when in doubt, follow your group leader's lead. Um, if depending on what direction the, the meeting is going in and, you know, if it's a hostile meeting or not, um, follow your group leader's lead. Um, <clears throat> remember who you're speaking with, if they're a state representative, if they're a senator, um, stick to the meeting script as much as possible and try to stay on track with that. There's a purpose for it. Uh, you shouldn't be having someone in your group, um, uh, advocating for something completely off topic. Um, give each group member an opportunity to participate and give your elected officials and staff a chance to respond. Um, and this is really important, like allow them to interact with you, that, with you as much as possible. It's all about relationship building, especially with the staff members because they are gonna be your way in with the legislators. And so give them that opportunity to ask questions, to interact with you. I've been in some of these legislative meetings where you have folks talking for 25 minutes and the staff member or elected official did not, was not able to say one word. So it, it you just wanna give them that opportunity. Next slide. So some of the language that you wanna use and metaphors around, for example, um, growth building and creation, you want to say things like, we are creating this. We hope you will help us build this. Uh, today we're planting seeds for this. Um, also saying who you are. I am a teacher. I'm a former refugee. Uh, I'm a, um, <clears throat> also saying things like Muslim Americans are neighbors and taxpayers. So like, how does your community or this co population contribute also demonstrating you or loved ones rootedness and investment in your state. I know this is California, but how long have you lived in this state? Or, um, you know, if you have a community member and why are you invested in this state? Next slide. 
And so I think that kind of gives a quick overview of like some of the best practices when it comes to talking now. And I think going to spend a little bit of time talking about outreach and comms. Yes, thank you so much, Nada. And I want to be mindful of time um, because we definitely want to open it up for some Q&A. Um, but outreach and comms, also a very, very important com component on ensuring the success of your advocacy days and or events. Um, as far as messaging goes, it's really, really important to be clear on the purpose of the event and why people should actually join and advocate, right? So self-interest is really important um, when you are trying to get partners and impacted individuals and allies to join, um, really ensuring that you're being clear around the purpose of the event. Um, you know, sometimes it's um, it becomes a little bit intimidating, specifically for folks who are joining legislative meetings for the first time. But we always like to remind ourselves that we are actually the experts and we are educating our lawmakers. I don't know how many individuals in this room have been in legislative meetings before, um, but many times lawmakers are actually unaware and uninformed of the policy change that we're trying to move forward. Forward. And so you would actually be surprised of how much that we're actually teaching the lawmakers about the issues that we care about in our community. Also, be very mindful around um, the policy change or the specific causes that you are actually advocating for. So again, being very intentional and clear with partners, with lawmakers, um, with anything that you post on social media. Um, and as you see here, we have a few posts um, on this on the screen to show you, um, you know, what we've done in some of our respective states to advocate um, to share on social media, um, you know, creating a flyer is very important. So if, whether you're doing this in person and or virtual, um, you want to ensure that you are sending invites out to your listservs, maybe you have Google groups, um, you want to make sure that you have a list of all of the participating registrants. And so you can do this through Google Google Forms, very easy and straightforward. You can do this through Eventbrite because you want to ensure that when you have folks signing up that you can follow up with them um, specifically for the prep webinars and the day of your advocacy days. So really important and easy to take um, advantage of promoting this on social media platforms. Um, also, um, really just keep in mind, um, you know, leverage from existing partnerships, right? As Nada mentioned earlier, um, this is very difficult to do on your own and sometimes impossible. You want to ensure that you're working with partners, whether in a coalition or a different uh, form structure of a partnership, that you are actually um, ensuring that your partners are also doing their fair share of work. So that means outreach, um, making sure that you're connecting with your community members, um, and promoting on social media to ensure that you can have as much, um, you know, traction on your advocacy days. Other sources of promote, promoting and or recruitment is establishing relationships with media, right? So this is where press statements, press conferences, um, op-eds really come into play and really bring a lot of attention um, into the day of your advocacy events. Um, and also being mindful on your goals for your advocacy days. So how many individuals are you trying to um, actually join on your advocacy days, right? So if you do set a goal of having 50 individuals in your state, you want to make sure that you communicate that with your coalition partners and that you hold each other accountable um, for outreach, right? So typically, just as a short example here in California, we will ask each organization what their capacity is for outreach and how many individuals they can show up. And sometimes, you know, you have one organization that might commit to three individuals and you'll have another organization that commits to 10 individuals. And that's okay because each organization will have different um, capacity levels, uh, but just ensuring that we hold each other accountable um, when it does come to promoting and recruitment. And just one really important note, make sure to include representation from impacted people. So we've discussed this a little bit throughout, uh, but really want to make sure that those with lived experiences are part of this, are sharing their testimonies, are educating our lawmakers, because that's really um, what makes the biggest difference. And from my experience, and I can say many others, a lot of lawmakers really love to hear the stories from those 
um, that have these personal experiences and has really swayed um, their interests in supporting um, pro-refugee and immigrant legislation. So just really being mindful of that as well. Next slide, please. All right, so really briefly as we're wrapping up, so next date is next steps for your advocacy event. Really, really important to debrief, right? So once your advocacy days are over, it's not actually over, right? You need to make sure that you not only follow up with attendees, but follow up with your legislators, right? So if you had a meeting, whether it be virtual and or in person, make sure that you follow up either via email um, with any fact sheets or follow up items that you have promised. If this, is in per if this is in purpose, then it would be those legislative materials and packets. Um, you also want to make sure that you debrief with your attendees, right? So this could be in the form of a feedback survey. It could be over a Zoom Zoom call if it is virtual and or it could be if it's in person that you just debrief huddle for five, 10 minutes right after the meeting, discuss what went well and what could change for the next meeting. These are very essential steps to ensure the success of your advocacy days and for your upcoming meetings. Um, and make sure that you do follow up with any media, any stakeholders who have expressed interest in your advocacy days. So I'm gonna stop there for the sake of time and I believe I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to Nada. Yeah, and I just want to emphasize to what Anahita was saying, the importance of really leveraging the media as, um, you know, to cover your event and also your agenda. Your, if you're pushing a bill, this is the time to really utilize the media to share stories of those who are impacted and also capture what's going on nationally. Is there an opportunity for a bigger story to be captured so utilize the media to leverage your agenda um, and push for what you're advocating for. So I think at this time, if we wanna to go to the next slide, we'll open it up for Q&A for two or three minutes to see if anyone has questions, reflections. Um, I know this is a lot, it's overwhelming, especially it's only one hour and a lot of information we covered, but let's open it up for Q&A if there's anything Anahita and I can answer. Hello. Um Neira and, nah and uh, Nahita, can you hear me? We can hear Hello? you. Oh, you can. <clears throat> Great pre presentation, well done. And you touched on all areas. Um, I've advocated or presented or in, the, in our legislative assembly in South Korea since way, way, way back. So, um, those are be best practices that we followed. But what we're missing here is uh, letter writing. That is very, very important. If we can uh, mobilize our allies to sit down and write just a short letter introducing yourself, who you are, why you're interested in this bill. Make it short and sweet and send it to DC or wherever they may be or local uh, legislatures. That works too. Yes, absolutely. Sending letters is always effective as well. Thank you, Clara. Other Thank questions you. and comments? This is your time to ask, don't be shy. I'm gonna add, um, that part you said about uh, connecting with legislators. Yes, you will have people on the other side that we call the opponent, or I call them hostile, <laughs> in, nicely. Um, but I found out, if I know exactly who are against our topic, let's say the Muslim ban or um, refugee uh, numbers, how the states are going to act on accepting them, what Trump did two years ago, where he forced us to actually see people in a, the worst. And you start wondering, these people have been my neighbors all this time and this is how they've been thinking. So don't give up on that. Go to them, talk, make a phone call. And don't go uh, being defensive. Just use your own way, a style of, um, uh, what do you call, 
disrobe them, disrobe them. And I, I mean, Naira, you know what I'm trying to say, that word, disrobe them. Just go to them, don't be, go to their level or even lower. You can find that, you can find common grounds. So yes, we've had horrible uh, legislation introduced in our state the past 10 years but that is not going to happen again because we worked hard. And uh, I personally know almost all of them. So what I did bef a day before the, um, like on a weekend before the bill was going to be uh, presented in the committee is call them on a weekend, they don't mind, or even email them. And I've done that. Yes, some may not respond. But still, do it. You never know what will happen. You a little message, I'm not saying little, may appeal to some of those hardcores. So don't give up. Go there with a, a positive attitude. That's all. We made it this far as refugees. Why should we be afraid to face these people? Yeah, yes, thank right. you so much, Clara. Thank you for that advice. Um, definitely you. good advice. Don't be afraid to speak to people or just because if they're a certain party. Um, so if there are no other questions, I think we're going to go ahead and wrap up. And if you can go yeah. to the next slide, address. Um, I know Claire had a question, um, and I want to be mindful of time as well. Yeah, so as far as how many days it takes to organize an advocacy day, I would say start at least two months in advance uh, planning. And as far as how long those days are, it really depends if you wanted to be a one day event or if you wanted to be like several virtual advocacy days where you meet with legislators during a week. So it really depends how you want to organize it. But I would say at least start planning two dates, two months in advance. Um, to wrap up, ways that you can get engaged, um, if you're interested in connecting with us, uh, follow, sign up for our news newsletter on We're All America on Churla website. You can also follow our social media. And if you want to connect directly with Anahita and I uh, on the next slide is our contact information. Do not hesitate to contact us. We... Um, um, if you can put our contact information address on the next slide, we have lots and lots of material that you can use. Feel free to reach out to us and ask before you start creating your own material so you don't have to recreate the wheel. We're happy to share any resources with you. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. And anything else you want to add, Anahita? No. Sorry. Just oh, sorry. I have the last question. Go ahead, Paul. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah, my question is, uh, how can we make the advocacy day with the local organization, uh, local uh, um, resettlement organizations? Because sometimes they did the uh, advocacy for refugee without the refugee. And how now? And they know that as a refugee delegate, we are here, but they try to do that without us. And when we, you know that, it is it's kind of something that for them don't look good. But now, what strategy do you use in the other states to work together with the local organization who work for refugees? Huh. Um, <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, thank you so much for that question. Just to briefly answer, because I know we're at time. Um, it's really, really important to engage these local resettlement agencies. I know sometimes there's a little pull and tug war. Um, sometimes they're not being as mindful and inclusive as possible. But as refugees, as impacted individuals, it's really our duty to organize um, these local resettlement agencies to be able to advocate. And so I know we've had our own challenges both in Arizona and California. And so if you'd like to reach out, we can definitely talk and strategize with you on how to better organize uh, some of these agencies that may have not worked with you in the past. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and it definitely goes back to relationship building, Paul, and really bringing them to do collective work together. 
So yeah. um, I know that we've covered a lot. Thank you all so much for attending. I hope that this was helpful to you. Uh, we will send out the recording and the slides. Once again, if you want to reach out to us directly for a question or material, feel free to do so, or you need help with your event, we're happy to help support you. Thank you all so much, and that will conclude our training for tonight. Thank you. Thank you.